Hi, welcome back to Film Story Recaps. Today I am going to explain a psychological thriller film called Mine. In between scenes, we see a hardened marine in camouflage saying goodbye to a young woman at the airport and flying to his next mission in a helicopter. The marine Mike and his spotter Tommy are set up on a cliff overlooking a desert in the following scene. When they see multiple people on foot on one side and multiple armed vehicles on the other side approaching, Tommy lightheartedly chats away while Mike remains fully alert and serious. Mike is hesitant because the descriptions provided for the target do not fully match what they are seeing. As Tommy and the voice on the radio try to persuade Mike to make the hit, he realizes the gathering is a wedding, and the target could be the groom's father. To make matters worse, the target is now standing behind the groom and is not known to have a son, but Mike is ordered to take out the groom in order to get to the target. Mike abandons the mission, claiming they've lost him, but they are discovered by the armed lookout scarring the ceremony. They escape thanks to a clever distraction Mike devises and request evacuation. They are instructed to cross the desert in front of them in order to reach a village where they can be picked up. They have four hours against armed enemies and the elements, so they get going. Back home, Tommy has a wife and a son, and Mike has Jenny, his girlfriend. Mike is revealed to be a man of few words, whereas Tommy is a chatterbox. Tommy is aware that something is consuming Mike on the inside, but Mike refuses to discuss it. The issue appears to be Mike's reluctance to take the big step of proposing to his girlfriend, which Tommy mocks. A warning sign comes whirling out of the wind and lands right in front of Mike's feet after they wade out a sandstorm in the middle of the desert. While Mike takes it seriously, reciting the number of mines buried in these lands, Tommy assures him that it's just a Berber trick to keep enemies away and that it simply means they're getting close to their destination. He starts walking around freely, muttering about how thirsty he is and cracking jokes. Tommy is grateful when Mike gives him some of his water. Mike is still walking cautiously, his mind on the warning sign they saw. Tommy, revitalized by the water he just drank, is carelessly walking backwards a few yards in front of him, goofing off about Mike being an overthinker. A click is heard when he stops walking for a second to remember something, but before Mike can warn Tommy, he resumes walking and the mind he'd stepped on explodes. Mike takes a step towards Tommy, temporarily deaf, and hears another click where his foot just landed. In a state of shock, he freezes. The sand from the blast begins to settle, and a ringing sound fills their ears. Tommy has survived the explosion but has lost both of his legs below the knees. He's screaming for Mike, completely oblivious to everything. Mike, unable to move, attempts to calm Tommy down. Tommy's panic increases when he sees the state of his legs, and he begins to scream even louder. When nothing else seems to work, Mike brings up Tommy's son, which calms him down enough for him to inject himself with the morphine marines keep in their front pockets. Tommy, in his agony, reaches for the second tube of morphine, and despite Mike's repeated warnings to stop, he injects himself a second time. Tommy shoots himself in the head while Mike watches helplessly, overcome by emotions and high on morphine. The rest of the film is about Mike trying to survive in the desert while unable to move. The first thing he notices is that the radio is still next to Tommy, who is standing several yards away. He makes do with what he has and gets the radio, only to discover that the battery is dead and the spare is on Tommy's body. Then another sandstorm strikes with full force. He is able to wait it out without moving from his position. When it's over, the first thing he notices is that the storm has brought Tommy's body, and thus the spare battery, right next to him, but the radio has drifted too far away. Within the next few hours, a stumbling Berber appears from over the hill Mike is facing. Ignoring Mike's life-threatening situation, he mocks him for not moving on and continues on his way, without even giving him water, let alone his radio. Later, however, a young girl appears, carrying Mike's flask, which the Berber had taken. She hands it to Mike, who is relieved to see that it is full of water. Despite the fact that the girl never speaks, she appears to tell Mike that he must exit the mine and move on. Mike becomes overly excited and loud in his desperation to get to the radio, scaring the girl away. Later, the Berber returns to frustrate him even more. He continues to talk about how Mike should move on, oblivious to his pleas for him to get in the radio. He eventually brings it over, warning Mike that he won't be able to hear any music where he is. Mike is finally able to contact his commanding officer. He is informed that the nearest time they can pick him up by land is in 52 hours. The Major advises him to try digging a ditch and jumping in it, which would result in only a non-life-threatening limb loss. Mike decides to tough it out and wait for help, counting down the seconds on his watch. He gets flashbacks from his past, of events and people that have haunted him his entire life, because he has nothing else to do but wait. We discover that as a child, he suffered greatly at the hands of his father, 
both physically and mentally, and was a constant witness to domestic violence in his own home. He considers himself a coward for joining the Marine Corps and abandoning his mother, in the care of an abusive husband, only to return when she was terminally ill. He also does not consider himself worthy of Jenny, which appears to be the source of his hesitation to propose. According to him, he has only exacerbated the relationship's problems, whereas Jenny has been nothing but patient, constructive, and loving. For whatever reason, all of his flashbacks end with him on one knee, just as he is now, with the sound of a click. He begins hallucinating as he becomes increasingly tired, sleep-deprived, and battered by the elements. Reality merges with his hallucinations, and he punches, shouts, talks, and yells in the middle of the desert. He survives two nights by repelling feral dog attacks. After the first night, the Berber comes by, still following a zigzag pattern to avoid the mines, and tells Mike he's lucky to have survived this long. Mike has had enough of him, but the Berber appears to become less dim as he questions Mike's life choices, constantly pushing him to stop being scared and move on. He tells Mike that he himself stepped on a mine and lost one of his legs. He displays his wooden leg to him. He claims he thought his life was over when it happened because no woman in her right mind would look twice at a one-legged man. Except he met his wife during his hospital stay after losing his leg. Since then, he's been blessed with a happy marriage and beautiful children, and none of it would have happened if he'd stayed focused on the mine like Mike is now. Mike sustains bite wounds on the second night of fighting off the dogs. He nearly collapses the next morning as a result of his thirst and fatigue, but the Berber catches him seemingly out of nowhere and nurses his wounds. Mike, tired of the Berber's endless optimism, accuses him of not caring about what happens to him because if he did, he'd bring help because he clearly knows how to avoid the mines. He speculates that the Berber's daughter brought Mike the water on the first day without the Berber's knowledge. The Berber takes a breather. We learn that he doesn't know where the mines are, he's just going in zigzags, and that it was him, the Berber himself, who brought Mike the water. He informs Mike that he no longer has a daughter, she was killed in a mine explosion during one of their father-daughter adventures to dig out mines and replace them with tin cans. Mike is perplexed as he listens. The Berber says he's glad his daughter came to meet Mike, but he needs to move on now. Then he walks away. Mike is almost ready to leave the mine when the Major informs him over the radio that his rescue has been delayed by several hours. His hallucinations become more realistic and frightening, but we learn that before she died, her mother lovingly gave him her blessing to move on with his life, and that his girlfriend, despite everything he's done to sabotage their relationship, sent him off on this mission with love, a smile, and a promise to wait for him. Mike's father confronts him in the desert as he completely disconnects from reality. He mocks and challenges him at first, but he becomes emotional after a while, apologizing for everything he's done. Mike is about to shoot him, but he doesn't, and they cry and hug each other. At that moment, he hears on the radio that the rescue team is passing by his location and that they need him to give them his exact location because they can't stop looking for him. Mike is being shot at by two people over the hill at the same time, and the only thing he has to signal his location, the flare, is out of reach. Tommy appears next to him alive and well, going over the facts with him and telling him what he needs to do, just as he's about to give in. Mike uses the last of his strength to shoot and eliminate the hostiles before digging a ditch to jump in as soon as possible. His determination to propose to his girlfriend now gives him the courage he requires, and he leaps. Nothing happens, no explosion occurs. He discovers that the mine he stepped on was a tin can, most likely placed there by the Berber's daughter when she was alive. Despite the non-lethal gunshot wounds he received during the standoff with the two hostiles, he shoots the flare and is rescued. Jenny is waiting for him at the airport, happy tears in her eyes. He drops to one knee in front of her before hugging her. I hope you liked it, subscribe for more content like this and hit the like button to help us out. Also leave a comment if you want us to recap your favorite movie. Thanks for watching.